Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Amen. We thank God for this day. We thank God for the privilege of the Sabbath. I welcome each one of you to our worship today. It is indeed a joy to be in the house of the Lord. I pray for those who are still on the way that the Lord may hasten their steps to come and joy with us in this worship. Uh, today, I want to share with us the health nuggets. I want to share the plight of a caregiver. Who is a caregiver? I know all, most, if not all of us, who are seated here in this congregation are caregivers in one way or another to a person of a specific illness, terminal illness. And terminal illness is that disease that, that goes beyond one year and needs personal care, needs medical care, needs management, and management even from home. And so today I will, I will share with us the plight of a, of a caregiver in the context of my experience. And let us pray. Our kind and everlasting Father who art in heaven, we worship you, we give glory to your name. Thank you, Lord. And as we want to share in your word, may your glory so shine, for it is in Jesus' name I pray and believe. Um, I happen to be a caregiver of a child who, who is having sickle cell. Uh, sickle cell is, is a disease of the bone marrow, and it is a genetical disease. It affects the bone marrow, and so the bone marrow produces defective red blood cells. And you know the red blood cells are responsible for, for transporting oxygen through the body. And so that means this body, this child or this patient will be having insufficient oxygen most of the time because the red blood cells are defective or rather, plus they die off very fast. And so I happen to be the, that parent. But as we share the plight of a caregiver, let us share from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 9. It says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to make it away from me. But he said, that is in verse 10, he said, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul had had great exploits for Christ. He had had wonderful revelations. And to keep Paul from from self, he was inflicted with a thorn in the flesh. And three times, Paul consulted with the Lord that that may be taken away from him. But what was the reply? My grace is sufficient, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In this verse, Paul not only reveals to us how weakness serves as a foundation for our lives in Christ, but how we might learn to rejoice in our weakness. When I got my baby Mitch, we called him Mitch. Mitch is a, is a lure word for gift. And so we called him Mitch because we had just lost a pregnancy and he was the next child, and so we were very happy. And 
called him Mitch, which means gift. And just like Paul, we were excited that God had given us a gift. But it so happened that at eight months, we realized Mitch had sickle cell. Just like Paul, I know even many of us in these congregations have consulted the Lord, not three times, even ten times, and asking God, why me? Why me, Lord? The Lord is saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made whole in weakness. The plight of a sickle cell is not easy for a sickle cell patient because most of this time you will be in the hospital. And so our lives, as many of us here would, would, would know, was in and out of hospital. But I want to encourage the such caregivers who are here with us that don't despair. At the right time, the Lord will come through. I was in and out of hospital, trying to manage with hospital medication. They are constantly on medication. Trying to do remedies because you realize it's not easy to sleep in the hospital most of the time. We could get admissions like on a quarterly with enough blood transfusions. And so it is never easy to take care of a sickle cell patient. But at some point, it gets so hard, it gets so hard. I had to quit my job at some point when my baby got admitted. He was around, around six years, not six years, around seven years. So you can imagine when a seven-year-old child have to start to learn walking all over again. We had to start to show him how to walk all over again at seven years. At that point, it became very difficult, very, very difficult. I had to quit my job. My boss asked me, asked me Ruth, will you be fine? But I told him, if the Lord will give us food on the table, I'm sure the Lord will ensure that we have food on the table. That is all we need. And indeed, the Lord has provided. We have never slept hungry. I'm here to tell such a parent, such a mother, that help comes your way. It is a thorn in the flesh, but the Lord is with you. God places people strategically for you. And God can use a sister or a brother. I want you to look beside you, right beside you, the person seated next to you. And that is the person the Lord will use for your plight. And at some point it got so difficult, especially in the year 2019, the year 2020, it got so difficult. We were in and out of hospital. And I want to tell you how God came through for us. In December 2020, Mitch got admitted. It was a bad admission. It was not a very good one. Um, he was in pain. He was in ex excruciating pain. To show you how painful it was, Mitch talked in Luo. And I don't know if I had been saying that all the time, but the words he said were in Luo, and it was like me talking. He said, Aol. Aol Nyarowala. So <laughs> you all know Mitch is not Nyarowala, but he talked that Luo word. 
it so happened that in the admission ward, we were with a friend of us whose son was also admitted. And she told me, Ruth, you know this condition can be treated. I was in India for treatment, and my child, my, uh, my doctor, had had several, several bone marrow transplant, transplants, and he has had over a thousand successes. And as she spoke that, really I desired, but I didn't think that was possible because we all know the finances that are involved. She was not the first person telling me that earlier on, God puts people to watch over you and to keep checking on you. And there's a lady also who kept telling me, Ruth, this disease can be treated. We lost our child and we wouldn't want you to go through what we went through. But I knew for sure we, 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 we wouldn't manage financially to take a child for treatment in India. And so, even as my friend, my friend is Marilyn. She was the one, her son was admitted at that time, Elder Uchuka's son. And she told me my doctor has had several successes in bone marrow transplant. I desired, but even as she talked, it went through here and went out through the other side because I knew financially it was not for us. But then we went back home with Mitch on 31st of December, 2020, was, he was discharged. We went back home. Schools were opened. He was not recovering well. He could not go to school. He could go for a week and come back. And we were like, oh no, this time round, are we losing it? I asked my husband, are we losing this battle? And at that point, we discussed what Marilyn had told us. But even so, we knew it may not be possible. But we kept asking ourselves, to whom shall we turn to? To whom shall we turn to? And we had nowhere to start from. We couldn't navigate how people take their patients for treatment in India. But we thought of prayer cell. I want to tell you, Prayer Cell family is a great family. Church family is a great family. And so those are the only people we could turn to. But before we call them, we were like, okay, let's get our facts right. So we saw an agency who gave us the figures as they were. And there were figures for... 100% match, 50% match, non-related match for bone marrow donor. And so I want to tell you, God places people strategically in your path. Just open up your heart. When I thought it may not even be right to go for, for sickle cell, bone marrow transplant, there's a sister who kept checking on me because her child too has sick, has sickle cell. And so she kept checking on me. How are you doing, Ruth? How are you doing, Ruth? That is Sister Emily Okuku. And one time she asked me, how are you doing? Because Mitch had just been sick and there were tears in my eyes. And she told me, let's go to my car. And Jacinta Were followed us and she told me, I told her, Emily, it's because we had discussed that with her and everybody has their misgivings on bone marrow transplant. And so we had had our misgivings. But this day, I told her, Emily, we want to go for bone marrow transplant. And she was like, you go. And I was like, oh. So she has approved of it. I consulted her sister who also normally checks out on me. She said, yes, you go. I was like, okay, God, what is changing all of a sudden? People are so positive about bone marrow transplant. 
and I realized God had placed them so strategically because had they said no, had they said what I had heard before, that if you go for bone marrow transplant, you end up coming back with two patients. You come back with the patient, still a patient, and you come back with the donor, a patient. But a time had reached, we had to move on. The prayer cell members came, we prayed over it. I thought they would be shocked at the figures. They said, Ruth, Boaz, let's move on. It is possible. And so we moved on. But we were like, how? We need seven million. At that point, we were using the worst case scenario that we don't have a full match donor. And so we did a seven million. How? Okay, let's create a wall. How? But something was still at the back of our mind. When they left after praying, they chose a chairman, they chose the treasurer, and they were, let's move on. Something still lingered at the back of our mind. We knew we didn't have a bone marrow donor. We, we had not yet discovered a bone marrow donor. And a bone marrow donor has to be a sibling. We only had two others. So it's only the brother or the sister. And they asked us, another question they asked us, when do you want to go? I very quickly said, in March, by March 15th. There is no doctor who told me we should go by March 15th. It was just faith. But also because we wanted to avoid April, because April had been very bad because of the rainy season. We, we hardly could escape an admission in April. So I thought, beyond April, no, March. And mark you, February was just ahead. We had one mom, and we didn't know how. We didn't have a bone marrow donor. We were like, okay. After the prayer cell left, we said, okay, let's get the bone marrow donor. And so we had to. The agency had proposed for us, you go with the brother, test the brother. Just go with the brother. But then, the following day when we were to go for the, for the test, something came to our mind that why go with one and yet the results take three weeks before they are back. In three weeks time, it will be end of February. Let's go with the two of them so that we know if we have a donor. So we went for the test. We went with all the children and uh, it was a tough period. It was a tough period for us. The three weeks were like the nine years that Mitch had lived. We were hanging on getting a bone marrow donor who had to be a sibling. Um, a parent is obviously a 50% match, but it is better to have a uh, a sibling. We prayed. Sister Nora Munda was helping us in prayer. And I know everybody else was praying for us. And on the day we were to get the results, that is after three weeks, the financial campaign was ongoing. But we had this battle at the back. I could not sit down on a seat, I could only sit on the floor. It was difficult. Uh, uh, to some extent, I limited God, and I told God, God, give us even half much. Even half much, Lord. Please. At around, Sister Nora did not take lunch that day. She was praying for me. And at around noon, going one, I received a message. Congratulations. Susan Lisa, 
is 100% match. What do we say, people of God? Susan Lisa was 100% match. On top of that, the brother was 50% match. And so we still had two donors. If on any occurrence the sister could not make it, a 50% match could do. And that is what the Lord can do. And so we continued with the campaign. It was successful. I look at the faces of everybody here. Not a single person failed to give in for me. And God for sure can open up the floodgates of heaven. When we talk of the floodgates of heaven, it is not some window opening and your financial needs flowing. It is the Lord touching the heart of that person seated right next to you to realize your plight and to come through for you. And so we, we got enough funds. But let me tell you, another difficulty came. A day, the day after the fundraiser was successful, I realized I was carrying two lives to India, two of my children to India for a, a procedure that most people are in doubt of. And I remember the following day I took a motorbike. I was going to, for, to process the visas. And at the back, I was singing this song in Luo. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy you through life has been my guide? Heaven, peace, divinest comfort, him by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befalls me, Jesus doeth all things right. For I know whatever befalls me, Jesus doeth all things right. And I was crying. I was crying on the motorbike. And we reached where I was to alight, cross over, take a matatu to town. And the motor guy, the motorbike guy asked me, what is it, ma'am? I just gave him his money and I ran off. Why was I crying? The life of my two children, taking them to India for a procedure that no one, most people are not giving me approval of. But the Lord is good. I want to clear something that it is a misperception that people have that um, a sickle cell donor stands some risk. I want to tell you for a donor, there is no risk as such. The same day the donor is admitted is the same day the donor is discharged. There is no risk for a bone marrow donor. For the sickle cell patient, it is a risky procedure. It is a very risky procedure, but the Lord is faithful. I urge those who may be in the congregation who are handling sickle cell patients that get to know the condition of other children, get to know if you have a donor among them, and if you happen to have a 100% match, please don't sit on it. About the finances, we had nothing. God touched people and they gave and we went for treatment. It is not an easy treatment. Another misconception that people may have is that they do a surgery on the donor, they do a surgery on the patient. There is no surgery. There's completely no surgery that is done. If there is any slight cutting on the donor, it is just to get the line where it is fixed. A donor is admitted four days before the transplant. He's injected some injections. 
that transports the bone marrow from the bones to the bloodstream. And so the bone marrow starts flowing in the bloodstream and on the day of, of transplant, they, 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 they do sort of like, it's like they pick, a procedure is done. The donor is connected to a machine and they're able to collect blood, collect the bone marrow from the blood, and the blood flows back to the bloodstream and they come out with the bone marrow. So no procedure is, no surgery is done. If you're being held back because a surgery needs to be done, no surgery is done. On the patient, it is given like a blood transfusion. But again, still very risky because the donor cells might start fighting the host cells and it becomes something else. But the Lord went through with us. We went to India, we came back. Mitch is now fine, he's sickle cell free finished his medications, he's yet to, to take vaccinations because they take vaccinations again one more time and then he will be fine. I want to tell us, you who is taking, who is a caregiver to a patient, don't lose hope. Let's share from the book of uh, Matthew 4.23. Um, a year or two before we got to go for treatment, my husband had lined a number of verses and every night, every single night when we went for devotion, we went through those verses until I was like, can we do something else? I didn't know that was his way of crying to the Lord. There are a number of them, but I'll pick on one of them. Matthew 4, 23, which says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases among his people. Brethren, the Lord is faithful. He is a healer. And he goes, still goes around healing all manner of diseases among our people. May you be blessed.